Good morning, Mount Olive and friends. Happy Tuesday. Uh, let us know how you're doing today. And as we're jumping on, let us know if you think spring is close or if you think it's not even close. It is a pretty nice morning here in central Wisconsin. The sun is shining. You can actually start to feel the warmth of the sun, which is a lot different than we've, we've had in the middle of winter. So um, yeah, let us know how you're doing and we will get started here shortly. Uh, we are going to be in Hosea, the book of Hosea today. Not a book that we, we tend to journey into very often. We're going to be in chapter 13. So Hosea 13, verses 9 to 14. And we'll just wait for a few people to jump on and join us. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Let us know, is, is spring close or not even close. So in order to um, understand the prophet Hosea's text today, we have to look at Israel's history leading up to this. So Israel was in captivity in Egypt, and they were led out of that captivity through God calling Moses to lead them. And God used Moses to lead them in some miraculous ways. And Moses was their leader, but at, at, there came a point where Moses couldn't solve the disputes of all the people. And so he started delegating things and you started to see more leadership structure taking place um, outside of God as their leader. Then Joshua takes over and Joshua is the commander that helps get them into the promised land. And, and Joshua is a faithful man. And then we enter into the period of judges. And we get to judges, God's people don't have a king. They have different leaders who are called judges who God raises up mostly to be military leaders to deliver them. But then the people fall back into idolatry. They turn away from God. God allows them to be taken over again. And this cycle continues with the judges. And so the people, instead of looking inward, saying the problem is we're not being faithful to God, they instead said, we need a king. We need a king who can give us security. Even though they had one, God was their king and he had a covenant with them that as long as they were faithful to him, they would be protected and he would fight their battles. That wasn't enough for them. Okay, they, they couldn't see that they were the problem and they said, no, we need a king. That's the problem. We don't have a leader, an earthly human leader. We don't have armies. So this was the problem. And, and Samuel, the prophet, warned them, okay, if, if you guys want a king, the king is going to um, make you pay taxes. The king is going to take your sons and put them into the military. That's what you're going to get if you want a king. But Israel didn't relent. And their desire for a king was also a rejection of God. So the first king that they had was not good. It was King Saul. And King Saul was not a godly man. And God had shown them that uh, the earthly king thing wasn't all that it was cracked up to be. The second king that came along was King David, and he was the best king that Israel ever had, the most famous king. He's a man after God's own heart. But even David had a lot of human problems. Well, after David, and he's only king number two, it just kind of went downhill from there. And there were some kings that were that were good in the in the process, but overall, Israel's faithfulness and their greatness tanked after King David and after King Solomon. And eventually... Israel finds themselves in a pretty bad place, uh, in a place where they're in captivity, uh, they, they have broken their covenant with the Lord. And here's Hosea's reading about all this. Hosea 13, verse 9. It says this, He destroys you, O Israel, for you are against me, against your helper. Where now is your king? to save you in all your cities. Where are all your rulers, those of whom you said, give me a king and princes? So now God is saying, Israel, you wanted this king. Where is your king to save you? Right? The, God was their king all along, but they forsook him. And he's saying, where's your king now, Israel? So it's a, it's a, it's a little bit of... of mocking its judgment, but it doesn't stop there. Um, we read on. 
I gave you a king in my anger, and I took him away in my wrath. The iniquity of Ephraim is bound up. His sin is kept in store. The pangs of childbirth come for him, but he is an unwise son. For at the right time, he does not present himself at the opening of the womb. Shall I ransom them from the power of Sheol? Shall I redeem them from death? O death, where are your plagues? O Sheol, where is your sting? Compassion is hidden from my eyes. So the punishment here that Israel has to endure is linked and likened to the pains of childbirth. And what happens in the pains of childbirth? There's pain, from what I'm told, pretty intense pain. Uh, but after that pain comes the reward, right? The reward of the child. And Jesus also says that for his followers, his, his death would be like the pain of a woman giving birth. And so just as Israel had to go through this dark time before the Messiah showed up, Jesus has to do the same. Jesus is restarting the story of Israel, and he has to go through these pains of childbirth by his death on the cross. Um, in John 16, 21, it says, A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. And Jesus says that and likens it to what's about to happen to him. The pain of the cross would be awful. It'd be awful for Jesus and for all those who watched and his disciples who would feel hopeless. But the pain of the cross would be overcome by the joy of resurrected life on Resurrection Sunday. And so that, that victory of the resurrection, Jesus shares that with us. And, and Paul even notes that in the New Testament. And he quotes Isaiah when he describes Jesus' triumph as well. And so we see this prophecy all the way back in Isaiah of the difficult things that Israel would go through before the king, the true king, Jesus shows up, and the same thing that Jesus would go through himself. And because he did, we share that victory with him. In him, the darkness of death is replaced by the light of life. And so for, for us then, when we go through darkness, when we go through difficult times, those difficult times are temporary. And for all of us, we're either in one right now, a dark, difficult time, or we're coming out of one and we're fe feeling and experiencing that relief going through the pains of childbirth, or we're soon about to go into a period of darkness. We're, we're all in one of those three places. And we're able to endure the darkness of this world because Jesus is the light of life that breaks that darkness. He's our healer. He's our redeemer. He's our savior. And he's our king. And we can learn a lesson from Israel and stop looking to the, the fake kings of this world, the idols that we turn to, to solve our issues, but the one who sits on the throne of the universe who has conquered death. And he promises us that our darkness is temporary. He is the light of life. And he has already overcome. He's already overcome death. He's already overcome pain. He has won the victory for us eternally. And so whatever darkness you're either in or coming out of or maybe about to go into, remember that that darkness has been overcome, that darkness is temporary, and we don't suffer without hope. Let's pray. Lord, it, it's such a, a privilege to see how your word works together, to see the prophecies of old be fulfilled through your son, Jesus, who endured the cross, much like the pains of childbirth, but was resurrected and brought joy and, and hope to the entire world, Lord. And that is our hope in difficult times. When we are in darkness, Lord, give us perspective. Give us perspective of the temporary nature of that darkness. Give us the perspective that you offer us through the cross and through the empty tomb, knowing that those promises are ours as well. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. God's blessings, everybody. Have an awesome day, and we'll be live again tomorrow morning. Take care.